The soul is a universal concept, developed in isolation by almost every culture on Earth. It's a fundamental part of human existence to question our place, purpose, and what comes after our passing. And a common expression of this train of thought is the concept of the soul, an incorporeal element of the self that cannot be observed and exists upon a spiritual plane beyond comprehension. It's the part of us that exists beyond us, the self without the body. In the English language, the word soul pulls from numerous European etymological roots, one being the Proto-Germanic siwas, meaning belonging to the sea, the stopping place of life both before and after death. Numerous ancient civilizations such as Egypt, China, and Greece have their own words to describe similar concepts, and there's even evidence that the concept of the soul was present in prehistoric civilizations. The word bleeds into all facets of our life. In English, phrases such as old soul or lost soul are used as descriptors frequently, and all hint at the soul being a source of personality, your soul being boiled down to your archetype, your ontologically true self that will continue to exist beyond your existence. This is the version of the soul presented in the Fear and Hunger series, a defining archetype that moulds the lens of existence for a subset of people, similar to how star signs function in the world of astrology. Though it's not a complete or all-encompassing descriptor for a given person, it has a tangible effect on the lens through which said person will interface with the world. This alone is an interesting concept to write around. Many writers are capable of creating compelling characters by utilising and subverting commonplace tropes and archetypes. However, where Fear and Hunger is elevated above its peers is how it presents us with numerous incarnations of the same archetype within its narrative, contrasting various characters who, despite sharing the same soul, act in opposition to one another. A common archetype across the series is the enlightened soul, those inquisitive sorts who pursue knowledge and come to be the defining thought leaders and intellectuals of their respective eras. Across six characters, series creator Miro Haviranen has given us diverging yet equally fascinating takes on fantastical intellectuals. From depraved and hedonistic medieval emperors to dancing 20th century wizards, join me as we explore the enlightened soul of fear and hunger, and how it subverts and interacts with traditional tropes relating to knowledge and intellectualism within the fantasy genre. Odds are you already know what Fear and Hunger is, I'm like a year late to the algorithm juice on this one, but in case I'm your first video essay on this by some sheer chance, here's a brief rundown. Fear and Hunger is a series of two RPG maker games set in the same universe created by indie developer and independent artist Happy Paintings, also known as Miro, also known as Orange. These are notoriously difficult games with a dark fantasy aesthetic shaped by things like Dark Souls, Berserk, Hellraiser, and Silent Hill. As with all good video games, it's based on or written by someone who plays tabletop RPGs. In this case, a homemade pen and paper game made by Miro literally just called The Dungeons of Fear and Hunger, where the whole goal was to put your friends in the most uncomfortable moral dilemma possible. That sounds really fun, send me the rule book, please. These games take place in a world very similar to our own. Many of the game's locations are just one-to-one -one replacements of real-world places, so the Eastern Sanctuary is in the Middle East, Abyssonia is Africa, Edo is Japan, Vatican City is Vatican City, etc. It's really just Earth, but with monsters knocking about the place, and even then that's rare. Fear and Hunger as a series takes place in exceptional situations and largely forgotten areas populated with monsters and strange creatures, but it's heavily implied that outside of these areas, the world is pretty much the same as Earth. No monsters, only a handful of wizards, it's very low fantasy. The first game takes place in a particularly evil dungeon in Rondon, which is literally just England, it's also kind of France, but it's mostly England. It's got the same flag and everything, and the name is just London with a single letter changed. The game is designed as an England simulator. I mean, I feel fear and hunger every time I walk to my local Tesco Express. Across the games, everyone we meet from Rondon is abrasive, self-important, and antisocial, which is accurate to us British people. I know a lot of my audience aren't from here, so I'm just going to confirm, yeah, we're all somewhere between Buckman and Henrik on the spectrum of personality. Across the series, we're given insights to a complete history of this world, from its earliest prehistoric days through to the mid-20th century, where Fantasy World War II is set to happen. We even see the Fantasy Germans invade Fantasy Czechoslovakia. 
Fear and hunger has an extremely deep history, with the earliest civilizations being shaped by the old gods, the intangible and eldritch manifestations of fundamental concepts of existence. At the centre of their pantheon are Grogoroth and Sylvian, the embodiments of destruction and creation, a dualistic take on the Hindu Trimurti, and in the second game we find out they have a son called Binushka, who make them a one-to-one -one of the Trimurti, gods representing destruction, creation, and sustenance of the natural world in between cycles of recreation. There's also the moon god Rare, and the god of the depths, whose whole deal is that bugs are really into him, and he's also kind of dead. The old gods are hard to understand or really conceptualise, as they're not beings in the conventional sense. They have a presence, sure, and can have real impacts upon the world. They also have distinct personalities and motives, but they're utterly divorced from humanity, they're concepts rather than reflections of the human experience. This game pulls heavily from Ed Greenwood's fantasy concepts of societies being built atop old ones. There's lizard people and blue cave dwelling people underneath the dungeons of fear and hunger that probably worship the old gods to some degree, and they also have their own pantheons from what we can tell. So it's pretty clear that humanity aren't the only species that the old gods need to care about. Humanity isn't the centre of the universe in the world of fear and hunger. And in fact, it's stated across both games that outside of Sylvian, the old gods don't really care that much about humans. The moon god Rare hates them in fact, and his bombastic side eye alone is enough to have humans ripping off their flesh in shame and rage. That's where Ulmer comes in, he's this game's Jesus Christ stand in. Like, Da'as literally calls him Christ in the first game, and a few books do too, it's pretty blatant. This guy sets the precedent that gods can be more than concepts, but rather reflections of humanity, a divine being within which a follower can see both themselves and see what they could become through discipline and zealotry. It's from this example that humanity decides they can just do godhood themselves, and we enter the era of the new gods. So it is that in the year 809, a group of five known as the Fellowship travel to the gates of the ancient city of Mahav, the site of Olmer's ascension, and seek to attain divinity and restore humanity from a period of universal decline. It's here that four of the five will sit the throne of ascension and become new gods, only to find out they are not the first. Fear and hunger has seen numerous cycles of new gods, humans who seek power to serve themselves, but become puppets of much older and more esoteric powers. There have been countless new gods across time, and each of them upon their ascension has lost much of themselves, being reduced to their basis state the shape of their soul. So it is that those born with the enlightened soul, those with the capacity to become great philosophers and thought leaders of their time, ascend to become new gods of enlightenment, keepers of knowledge. There have been many, but the first we know of is Betel. Patel is the first known new god of enlightenment, he's the first being to have an enlightened soul that we definitively know sat the throne of ascension and achieved godhood. There's very little about him in game, the only depiction of him is this wacky statue, but what he represents is something entirely unique to enlightened souls, precedent. Most other soul archetypes we see ascend to godhood are able to at least pick whereabouts they operate and have their own MO to some degree, but every single enlightened soul that ascends has to work in Battelle's library. It's outright stated in the Hall of the New Gods that every single new god of enlightenment has to spend their cycle acting as a subject matter expert in the grand libraries of Mahab. They're the most restricted soul archetype when it comes to divinity. Battelle's frequent collaborations with other enlightened individuals marks him as more of a scholar than the traditional guy that knows everything fantasy knowledge god. I don't think Hermaeus Mora would ever request a peer review, but Battelle probably would. What this tells us is that gods of enlightenment aren't all-knowing beings, they're just pretty smart guys with huge lifespans. A new god of enlightenment isn't someone capable of knowing everything there is to know, rather they're someone capable of creating a field of study that will have an impact upon their age. They're more great philosophers and researchers than conventional gods. Where other gods are able to be more variant in their motives and means, gods with the enlightened soul are those beings who go on to become foundational thinkers of their era, often shaping cults of personality around themselves and seeking out disciples to continue their teachings. This actually has a tangible effect on the longevity of enlightened new gods, as whilst many new gods fade into obscurity, all enlightened new gods are still known by the year 1941, including Battelle. This is likely because they offered so many works that it's hard for them to simply fade into obscurity. 
Of a new god's fade from memory, Patel is the centerpiece of an exhibit in the Preheville Museum, and stones imbued with his power are still utilised. In this sense, the chain of new gods of enlightenment is closer to our real-world ongoing developments within the fields of philosophy and academia, and Patel is like Socrates, though for reasons I'll discuss shortly, I believe he has an even more apt real-world counterpart. I want to reiterate here that not everybody born with the enlightened soul is immediately some super genius, the same way not everyone born in the month of May, my birth month, is immediately a genius. Just most of us are. Similarly, not everyone with a non-enlightened soul is stupid. Characters like Maria, Don, and literal bleeding heart poet Ron Chambara are proof enough of this. What the soul represents is a core essence upon which a personality can be built, but upon ascension, or moon scorching, which is something we'll talk about later, all that remains is this core essence. A central theme of the new gods is that they're little more than pawns to the whims of the old gods, and out of all of the soul archetypes, it is likely that enlightened souls are the most useful for their machinations due to their capacity to shape thought. This is why the enlightened soul is the most prevalent soul type within named characters across the series, and probably why enlightened new gods have the least free reign in their behaviours. I'll come back to this when we discuss Valtiel and his symmetry with Vitruvia, but for now all we need to understand is that enlightened new gods are highly useful tools for the greatest powers in the universe, and their philosophies and research often go on to impact the world for centuries. Including candidates who have the option to ascend but choose not to, there are five named potential new gods with the enlightened soul, which is far more than any other soul archetype. The most any other sees is two. Patel is the blueprint for what an enlightened new god should be, but what he represents is less esoteric and cryptic than his successors. His name pulls from the biblical Bethel, meaning house of God in Hebrew. This might be a bit of foreshadowing as to how his house, the library, goes on to become the source of research that benefits the old gods for almost all of recorded history. However, his closest real-world ties aren't to this location, but rather the Neo-Assyrian Empire, and King Ashurbanipal, who reigned around 600 years before the birth of Christ. Patel doesn't appear to be human, he looks closer to the golems of Mahab, so there's every chance he existed before Ulmer or even mankind. Again, Fear and Hunger's world is basically just our world with a few hotspots of weird stuff going on, and a few pre-human civilizations do exist, which seem to be parallels to kind of early human civilizations. Mahab, the site of Patel's library, has very pronounced Mesopotamian vibes, and Patel is outright said to be Mesopotamian in Termina, so real world history is somewhat applicable, and both the fictional new god and the real world king are foundational to knowledge and our understanding of it through the creation of a grand archive, or big library. Ashurbanipal established the first ever proper library, there were a few collections of books beforehand, but his is the first one where there was a concerted effort to store numerous works across a wide array of subjects and catalogue them. Both represent humanity reaching a point where there is so much written knowledge that there becomes a concerted effort to store it all. Interestingly, it's from Ashurbanipal's library that we get the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is one of a handful of texts referencing the god Enki, a name that will be familiar to you by the end of this video if it isn't already. Both figures, Batel and Ashurbanipal, look to expand their own knowledge by collecting and amassing knowledge, and also employing scribes and scholars to create wholly new and original works for their libraries. In this sense, both are representative of the same concept, the birth of academia and centralised places of learning. Ashurbanipal had a particular interest in divination and esoteric art, similar to many of the enlightened souls in Fear and Hunger. So in this sense, Patel is just this universe's Ashurbanipal, a founding father of academia, an esoteric sorcerer type guy, an individual who shapes the very concept of thought. However, the precedent he sets is to serve the old gods, and it is his precedent that informs all born after him with the same soul type. His openness to collaboration actually ends up being his downfall when he's tricked out of his divinity and his library by the next new god of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. 
Patel is the blueprint for enlightened new gods. He establishes that they're intellectuals who serve the whims of the old gods and create cults of personality that further the aims of these eldritch powers. But it's his successor that's the first real character we see doing all of this, just by virtue of being a more fleshed out character. Nasra is a generic evil wizard in the best possible way, straight out of a pulp fantasy novel. He's basically a fusion of Acerarak from Dungeons and Dragons, the Norse mythological figure Mimir, and the Lovecraftian character Abdul Al Hazret, who is the author of the Necronomicon, something that is an item in Fear and Hunger. Abdul Al Hazred also first shows up in a story about an exploration to a Mesopotamian themed ancient city and then shows up in 20th century stories, so he undergoes the exact same arc as Nasra. Nasra is the first enlightened new god we know to have established a cult that continues to exist into the modern day. Despite his reign happening at some point in the 5th century, his cult exists as late as 1942, and he's still alive at that point as well, making him the longest lived of the new gods that are actually active and doing things, and not just kind of hanging out in the lunchroom. Nasra is the creator of the Yellow Mages, a group of opium smoking weirdos that venerate Grogoroth rather than any new god, but not out of respect for a higher power. Yellow Mages are opportunists who align themselves with whatever makes them the most powerful. They're a might makes right group, motivated by ego and individual power more so than anything else. In game, Yellow Mages won't even let you join their cult unless you can straight up kill them after they give you their Eclipse Talisman, so that's the kind of guys they are. Although you can just swipe the talisman and then run away if you can't figure out that yellow mages are actually probably the easiest enemy in the game to beat. The yellow coloration is another reference to cosmic horror literature, the King in Yellow series by Robert Chambers. This is a series of books that would later be included as canon in the Lovecraft mythos. The King in Yellow series focuses on a play that is said to drive observers and actors insane, and the protagonists of this series are often highly involved with the decadent movement of the 19th century. It's this real-world cultural movement that informs a lot of how we view Nasra. For all of his evil wizard behaviour, as with all gods of enlightenment, Nasra is also just kind of a figurehead for real-world philosophy. Fear and Hunger's world is really similar to ours, there's always going to be overlap, I think I've made that clear by now. The decadent movement is the 19th century cultural phenomenon where, as European society approached the fin de siècle, or the turn of the century in English, there was an increased interest amongst the wealthy to just go crazy, drive yourself to the limits of sensation. There was a fascination with aesthetics, egocentrism, and exotic sensations and experiences. London in the late 19th century was a hotbed for esoteric practices. There were frantic orgies, opium dens, all of that. And this is the same kind of stuff that the Yellow Mages are really into. Nasra re-emerges in a London-inspired city to form a cult of opium smokers during a period of decline. It's exactly the same thing. Critics of the decadent movement often cite it as a movement of societal decline, which informs Nasra's title the doom of modern man. Nasra isn't the doom of modern man because he's a powerful spellcaster, it's because he preaches ideas that feed the paranoia of declinists. It's his enlightened soul, his ability to communicate ideas that makes him dangerous, although the giant fireballs do probably help. In Dungeon Knights, an easter egg game mode, Nasra is a teacher, again showcasing his role as someone who can spread ideas to newer generations of academics. This is also his role in Termina, where he leans more heavily into the Mimir role of advisory talking head. It's his ideas that go on to inform Kaiser, and he can also teach Enki at various points in the game. Nasra is a decadent through and through. He values knowledge over simplicity, he believes strongly in pushing oneself to the limits of experience and knowledge, and he has little qualms over morality or ethics. There's no limits to acceptability in his mind. I really like Nasra for this reason. He's very simple, but also very compelling. Usually in dark fantasy, we have characters go completely mad from getting too into forbidden knowledge. In Dark Souls 1, which is an inspiration for this game, it happens to two characters. But Nasra revels at the edges of experience. He doesn't go that mad. He even throws insults at the god his cult worships and dies purely because he just loves doing crazy stuff. 
equal parts Rasputin, Alhazred, and Machiavelli, it's hard not to love him in spite of how reprehensible he can be. Nasra also represents a foundational aspect of academia, which is hating other academics. He absolutely despises his successor Valtiel, he hates his research, he hates his creations, he hates the guy on a personal level, and that's just how academics are. Throughout all of history that's true, from Diogenes throwing a dead chicken at Plato to whatever the hell is going on in bread tube infighting. People who do a lot of thinking really dislike other people who do a lot of thinking. So let's discuss Valtiel. Valtiel is a member of the Fellowship and the current New God of Enlightenment as of Fear and Hunger. He succeeded Nasra in the Grand Libraries. His area of study is the human body and he is fruitlessly looking on ways to improve on it or just outright create a new species. This section is going to include tinfoil hat theories that I hope will bring together all the disparate tangents I've been going on, so please stay with me here. Whilst Patel is the first confirmed new god of enlightenment, in Fear and Hunger 2 we learn of an older being called Vitruvia who is named for the Vitruvian Man. This figure was made to design mankind for Sylvian. Creation of entirely new species is something we also see play out with Valtiel, and to a lesser extent with most of the other new gods of enlightenment, Nasra creates husks, for instance. This leads me to believe that Vitruvia is not an old god, but rather a contender for the first new god of enlightenment, someone pre batel After all, she's clearly not an equal to Sylvian, rather an underling, and this seems to be the same position that Valtiel is in. Valtiel takes his name from the Silent Hill 3 enemy, Valtiel, really similar, um, the I and the E are swapped around, and this name pulls from valet, which is the French word meaning attendant. They are attendants to gods. Sylvian is the most interested in new gods of enlightenment who can either improve upon the human form or create new forms for her to love. She seeks attendants like Vitruvia or Valtiel. Whilst the other new gods can go out and do whatever, enlightened souls are stuck in the library doing the work of the old gods, be it Nasra creating a cult of Grogorov or Valtiel continuing the work of Vitruvia in service of Sylvian. The Fellowship, one of the most important era-defining groups ever pulled into the thrall of the old gods, contains two enlightened souls across five people. This is all proof that the purpose of enlightened souls is to enact the will of the increasingly more distant old gods upon humanity, and these parallels between Vitruvia and Valtiel show that this is something that they've always been doing. It's posited by many of the characters that becoming a new god is to become a puppet of the old, but what exactly the old gods want with the new ones is pretty vague. Dominating souls just go on big rampages around the place upon ascending, and Francois becomes a dog breeder. We see tormented souls like Ragnavolda and Ron Chambara also just go around on big rampages. This can be said to be aligned with Grogorov, his wolf mask cultists basically just do this, but there isn't much direction here, it doesn't seem like there's really a plan. The radiating one is a new god in Termina who ascends just to sell you amulets. How this fits into the old god's plan is really anybody's guess, I'm actually quite curious to see any theories about that. Across soul archetypes we see very few as closely aligned and desired by the old gods as the enlightened souls. Nasra venerates Grogorov, he creates a cult with far more lasting impact and reach than the wolf masks, and Valtiel seems to operate to some degree in the interests of Sylvian. Their intellectual feud can then be seen as the foundational concepts upon which the universe is built, the dance of Grogorov and Sylvian, playing out on the micro scale. Nosramus, a potential substitute for Valtiel, also has an interest in the creation of life, having written books that teach the player how to summon demon kids. Enki, a potential successor to Valtiel, introduces himself in his first line of dialogue as a priest of destruction, again showing the scale swinging between the two old gods with each new enlightened soul who comes to stay in the library. Enki is also the only playable character to be brought to the dungeon by divine means. He receives a vision of the future at his crucifixion. The other three playable characters are all motivated by personal reasons, but Enki is being reached out to by gods. Granted, it's not an old god, but the new god Nilvan who calls him, but we know that the new served the old. Again, we see a great emphasis on the influence of divine beings upon those with the enlightened soul. They're the ones who are being actively scouted to come and ascend, explaining why two-fifths of the fellowship fit this archetype. The ultimate way of showing devotion to Sylvian is to partake in a marriage. 
the fusion of two beings in a carnal ritual that sees them become one being, a hermaphroditic creature closer to the form of Sylvian. Valtiel creates the uterus enemy type purely as incubation chambers for his own children. His motives are closely aligned with Sylvian in this regard. This dude is doing way more blood sugar sex magic than the bunny masks, the actual confirmed Sylvian cultists. His freak is utterly unmatchable. When the new gods are asked about Valtiel, they'll comment that he believes creation of life is the key to true godhood, again showing a subconscious affinity for Sylvian. Valtiel is a lot like the Kushan sorcerer Diba from Berserk, one of the game's influences. In Berserk, as in Fear and Hunger, there's a stated hierarchy of divinity. There's the God Hand, the most powerful beings akin to Fear and Hunger's old gods. They exist beyond our reality and serve as embodiments of concepts that influence the world in subtle ways, each with strange hedonistic cults in the hidden places of the world. Below them are the Apostles, powerful beings akin to the new gods, and below the Apostles are humans. Daiba is a researcher and sorcerer who looks to bridge the gap in a manner similar to Valtiel, creating a great artificial womb within which to gestate a new god with the power of an old one, and usher in a new age. Both also create artificial beings to look to supplant humanity, and both are ultimately unable to break free of the divine tier system. In the case of Valtiel, the Lord of the Flies is his attempt at a new form of humanity, but it's ultimately a failure. The creature's name, Lord of the Flies, is a reference to the demon Beelzebub showing that creatures are the opposite of divine. Rather, they are demonic entities, utterly unable to meet the standards set by his predecessor Vitruvia. To put it in less academic terms, this guy sucks at his job and he keeps flopping, to the point where it drives him to turning himself into a decoration inside of his library. Vitruvia had a similar issue, finding constant flaws in her creation, her growing issues with humans leading to the creation of all myrrh. As a dark priest, Valtiel had dedicated his life to the worship of the old gods prior to his ascension, and in his ascension he served their interests and stated motivations more so than any other from the fellowship who he ascended alongside. The trap of divinity is most appealing to those with the enlightened soul, and perhaps this is symbiotic as those with a capacity for shaping collective thought are most desirable to the old gods for whatever machinations they have upon humanity. In this sense, enlightened gods are effectively pawns of the old gods those driven by a pursuit of knowledge who are ultimately trapped in depressing cycles of failing to achieve the impossible standard for divinity that has been set for them, and being supplanted when someone better aligned to serve the ancient masters of the universe arrives at the library. To be born with an enlightened soul is to be born with the ability to shape universal thought, but never enough to reach the potential expected of you. Vitruvia and Valtiel both serve the interests of Sylvian, whilst Enki and Nasra represent the interests of Grogoroth. However, only through rejection of these higher powers do they attain true enlightenment. In order to be a true free thinker, to be truly enlightened, one must reject the trap of divinity, reject the standard of the old gods and instead set a new standard for humanity. The world of fear and hunger can be shaped for the better, shaped permanently, but it will not be by a god but a mere mortal. Nasra and Valtiel came to know this too late. Only after they had spent centuries in service of gods they came to despise, failing to achieve that which they believed they could. However, there was one who realised the trap of divinity early enough to save themselves, and in doing so would come on to become the most influential intellectual in the history of Fear and Hunger's world. Despite being called the Forgotten One, Nosferamus has a massive impact on the world of fear and hunger in unseen ways. His philosophies are the most prevalent in the sequel, though admittedly most of this is due to the work of his greatest student. Nosferamus develops the concepts that go on to influence Enki and bring about fear and hunger's equivalent of the Enlightenment. He's also on the start screen of the game instead of actual characters you can play as, which is kind of fun. You can't get Nosferamus' soul in game, so for full disclosure here, they might not have an enlightened soul, but they very probably do. I don't see them having any other kind. It would be weird if they had, say, a caressing soul when they go on to bring about the Enlightenment. Born sometime between the 8th and 9th centuries, similar to their companion Valtiel, Nosramus rejects divinity to follow the path of Enlightenment. Miro was kind of crazy for doubling up on fantasy wizards, because writers don't usually do that with tropes. But it's an interesting choice here, as there's a lot of crucial differences between the two that shape how we view souls. Valtiel and Nosferamus occupy the same archetype, yet have fundamentally different thoughts on the natures of existence. 
This alone is proof that a soul is not a strict classification that overrides individualism, but rather something that comes to embody you if you reach a divine state or moon scorch. That's the only time it becomes an all-consuming facet of identity. Where Valtil represents the orthodox views of the clergy he was raised in, Nosramus is shaped by the views of the common man, the observable universe. Where Valtil dresses in the robes of an orthodox black priest, Nosramus dresses in simple rags, likely being someone from a less formally intellectual background or someone less concerned with the pomp of orthodoxy. Nosramus takes their name from Nostradamus, the French apothecary and writer who some believe predicted future events in his book Les Prophecies, which informs his ability to foresee the trap of divinity. But Nosramus's philosophy is more so in line with someone like Immanuel Kant or John Locke, philosophers who shaped the real world enlightenment. The enlightenment was an intellectual and philosophical movement largely concerned with fathering mankind's understanding of itself advocating for liberty, rationalism, a formal separation of church and state, and progress. Nosramus, similar to many thinkers of the Enlightenment, rejects divinity as a source of information and authority, instead valuing the scientific method and research. Kant once wrote, Nothing is divine but what is agreeable to reason, a quote that largely explains the philosophy that Nosramus subscribes to. He knows that gods exist, he was even a friend to some of them, but he rejects the notion that divinity inherently makes something correct, instead wishing to place focus on the observable universe, study, and actual tangible outcomes. Nosramus is working as an alchemist in the dungeons of fear and hunger, and their current interest is environmentalism. They believe humans are destroying the planet and are seeking solutions for this. This is interesting, as, again, all of their motivations have nothing to do with godhood. They're more material than immaterial. And whilst Nosramus will advocate for studying the gods as a form of knowledge, he has no further interest in divinity and seeks human solutions. Enki continues much of this writing on the environment. He ends up getting censored by the Vatican in Termina for writing that humans might be destroying the planet in the Vanishka Skin Bible. This is a pretty subtle environmentalist message in a game about gods and monsters, and again shows that true enlightenment is an understanding of humanity that is divorced from divinity. Across the Fear and Hunger series, we see humanity in conflict with itself, repeating vicious cycles of bloodshed out of confusion and a desire for personal gain. But through Nosramus, we see humanity in a positive light, the ability to learn, understand and grow, to respect the natural world and see things for how they really are. And Nosramus is a pacifist. They won't fight you under any circumstance, even if you rob them, so they are rejecting the vicious cycles of the universe they exist in. Nosramus comes to learn that enlightenment is not a set point, but rather a lifelong journey, a theme I expect to see play out across Lagarde's arc in any future installments. Nosramus themselves is foundational not for their own thoughts, but how they act as a tutor and blueprint for the true source of fear and hunger's enlightenment and real focus of this video, Enki Ankarian. Enki is the first actually playable character on this list, he's also the single most influential thinker in the history of Fear and Hunger. His philosophy is interesting as it shifts numerous times. He can be a student to both Nasrat and Nasramas at various points on his journey, internalizing numerous works of those who came before him and using it to shape the foundations of modern thought. Even prior to arriving at the dungeons, he was a known philosopher and academic, he's said to be familiar with all the books in the great libraries of Rondon. Enki is the glue that ties together this disparate academic tradition, the character who fuses all prior thinkers' philosophies into one overall mindset. From Termina, which takes place in the 20th century, we learn that Enki, who lived in the 16th, is still a well-regarded philosopher. His writings create schisms within the Church of the Dark Priests. This is another facet of Miro's writing that's really good. Religions aren't treated as homogenous groups, but rather groups of people that can infight and disagree on things. Fantasy writers often just write up their Christianity stand in and call it a day, not realizing that there's hundreds of unique ways to practice Christianity, and the history of the faith is a history of infighting. In Termina, a character named Father Hugo rewrites Enki's book on Vinushka to remove passages about the negative effects of humanity upon the environment, twisting the words of a great thinker to befit the narrative he wishes to push, seeking academic legitimacy through Enki's reputation. 
In the Hall of the New Gods, Enki is described as a prime candidate for emerging as a luminary of some new epoch, and that's exactly what he is. His writings on divinity and the nature of man go on to become the defining texts on the subject. Entire civilizations' concepts of faith are built around his work. As stated earlier, the Vatican edits his text to legitimize their own ideas as humanity enters the Cruel Age, an era similar to our real-world Industrial Revolution. Personality-wise, Enki is video essayist material. He's antisocial, frail, obnoxious, he always looks tired, some of his closest friends are insects, he's very relatable, he's a lot like me in many regards. His name is the same as the Sumerian god Enki, the god of knowledge and creator of human life, though Miro has said before that this is just a coincidence. In the Deluge, the Sumerian version of the Flood myth, it is the knowledge given to humans by Enki that allows them to survive the floods sent by the gods. Enki brings knowledge that rejects the desires of gods and allows humanity to flourish, so the name is apt even if only coincidental. In the words of Master Ugwe, there are no accidents. Enki's motivations for coming to the dungeon aren't as personal as the other three playable characters. Instead, he comes seeking knowledge on the prophecy surrounding Lagarde off the back of his own divine vision. He's already a highly respected priest and philosopher at the beginning of the game, but he was ready to end things after believing he'd learned all there was to know. In this sense, he's similar to Valtil, believing he's reached the limit on how much he can develop due to an inability to look outside of the defined parameters of intellectualism set by the old gods. It's through discussions with his teachers, Nasra and Nosramus, that he learns to view things differently, and goes on to reject divinity in favour of human-centric views of the world, quite literally ushering in the Enlightenment. This calls to mind Plato's story of the cave, wherein a man who spends his entire life within a cave cannot conceptualise a world outside of it. Enki has spent his life limited by conventional and accepted knowledge, and for that he's blind until Nosramus opens his eyes. This is made more apparent by the reading of the writings of Valtil, who despairs that he's reached the limits of his mind in spite of his godhood. He is incapable of seeing things outside of the cave that the trap of divinity puts him within. Like Nasra, Enki will utilise the powers of the old gods to his advantage. If you aren't playing as him, but don't recruit him, he will engage in a marriage to gain power from Sylvian. But like Nosramus, he can come to believe divinity to be a trick. He sits the throne of ascension and uses it to gain insight rather than power, rejecting his own godhood in his S ending. Fear and Hunger has a dubiously accepted canon due to things confirmed in Termina. Enki's S ending is largely believed to be what actually happened, but take all of this with a grain of salt. It's time for a tinfoil hat theory, because Vitruvia being a new god of enlightenment probably wasn't controversial enough, and I need to say something crazy. I legitimately believe that Logic, the machine god born of human suffering and ingenuity in Termina's A ending, is a direct result of Enki and his studies into humanity. To explain this theory, let me tell you a story, and whether you choose to believe it or not, I'll leave up to you. After all, who really knows what happened? This is the story of two men, one a great warrior driven by destiny, the other a curious mortal with a thirst for knowledge. Europa in the Age of the New Gods was defined by cruelty, and it's in this harsh world that two young men would rise to prominence. Lagarde, a peasant born with nothing, rose from the gutters of Europa, bringing with him not a golden staff but a thousand pitchforks setting ablaze the established order with his Knights of the Midnight Sun. Half the continent away, the child Enki cuts down his own sister and is inducted into the Order of the Dark Priests, learning many of the Old God's secrets. Lagarde and Enki both pursue knowledge, dive deep into esoteric prophecies, and both come to the Dungeons of Fear and Hunger. Lagarde arrives first to push his own claim at Godhood, a true Godhood capable of rivaling all myrrh. Enki, despondent at having learned all there is to know, crucifies himself, before being granted a vision of Lagarde. Enki hurries after the man, utterly captivated as so many are, but upon arrival in the dungeons he finds him dead. As he dejectedly leaves the cell, he's approached by a strange white-haired alchemist who states there is still much to be learned in the city below the cell. So it is that Enki, accompanied by the dismembered head of Nasra, as well as the outlander Ragnavalda and his pet Moonless, dive deep into Mahab, and rejects his own divinity, 
taking the libraries of Battel for his own. Meanwhile, Lagarde is resurrected by a ghoulish ritual performed by his loyal knight Da'as, bursting from his corpse in a visceral metamorphosis. He declares that he is a god, but comes to realise now that the prophecy does not refer to him. Instead, his daughter, the newly born god of fear and hunger, an abandoned child who descended into the dungeons and mantled the power of the god of the depths. Returning to the surface, Lagarde finds the world changed. Monsters like himself are hunted to the dark places of the world by the outlander and his descendants. So it is that Lagarde operates in darkness for centuries, amassing power within the country of Bremen as well as in the eastern sanctuaries, exploding onto the political scene in the 20th century as he had centuries ago, not with a golden staff, but with a thousand pitchforks. Lagarde returns to the dungeons. The Bremen expedition inside can be happened upon by aspiring yellow mage Osar. One can only imagine the rage and frustration of being cheated out of your destiny, being consigned to the annals of history, a living ghost and a man out of time. He had to have missed something, surely. Something in these dungeons that would grant him his birthright, his divinity. It's here, I'll wager, that Lagarde finally came face to face with the Enlightened One, who had come here some centuries ago in search of him. A long overdue meeting occurs in the libraries of Mahab. Oh, I know you. You're supposed to be important, I think, says the unkempt librarian, sleepless nights buried in books visible on the bags under his eyes. The two converse, both happy to meet someone from their own time, and so it is that Enki imparts a lesson he was taught by Nosramas. Study the old gods, and the new gods too. There's lessons to be learned in both cases. Alongside this, he imparts the teachings of his master Nasra, and Lagarde learns of the human dilemma, the belief that humans cannot attain divinity within the constraints of the old gods, and must instead construct their own framework to rise within. We see this discussion play out again in Termina, Nasra and Lagarde talking philosophy and debating the subject that was discussed in that ancient library. So it is that Kaiser returns to the surface. He has escaped both the dungeons and the cave of thought that he was in. He sets about building logic, a human god born of human ingenuity. As Enki did, Kaiser is happy to use the old gods to suit his needs. He creates grotesque soldiers out of Sylvian marriages, but he crosses out divine symbols in his machines, and he rejects working within the divine system. Ultimately, this sees Lagarde once again cheated out of his divinity, but this is something he comes to terms with, understanding that he is not a god, but a god-maker, the creator of the eternal machine that will drive humanity eternally. Kaiser, now enlightened, seeks the end of history. Fear and Hunger 3 isn't out, so logic might not have even been turned on. We don't know the canon ending of Termina. However, irrespective of ending, we know from the existence of the tunnels that Kaiser sought divinity through humanity. We know he returned to the dungeons during Enki's tenure in the libraries, and there's every chance that the two operate on a shared intellectual framework, as they both have interest in the same philosophies, such as Nasrar's concept of the human dilemma. Here again, we see the enlightened souls of fear and hunger being the true power behind its world, ushering in the changes of each age. We also see a new form of humanity being created, which seems to be a theme with each new cycle of enlightenment. With Vitruvia, it's humans. With Battelle, it might be the stone golems in Mahab, but that's a headcanon of mine. With Nasra, it's the husks. With Valtiel, it's the Lord of the Flies. With Nosramas, it's the Demon Kids. And with Enki through Lagarde, it is Logic and possibly the Doppelgangers. An aspect of enlightenment in this world is to ponder the human form and to seek to further it, reaching true divinity through changing the human form. However, Enki is not the last enlightened soul. The world doesn't end at logic, and there's quite a bit of academic tradition that goes on in the four or so centuries between the two games. There's someone who comes after him, and his ending symbolizes a uniquely 20th century post-enlightenment train of thought that simply couldn't have existed prior to Termina. So let's talk about Osar. Osar, the aspiring yellow mage and most recent student of Nasra, is an interesting character, probably more so than he gets credit for. Unlike all the other enlightened souls before him, we don't know what happens to him. 
but all possibilities are interesting. His B ending, the fandom's continual lumping him in with the party that gets the A ending, and his moonscorched forms are all things that I want to discuss, so strap in for a long section here. Whilst all of the prior information was largely taken from the first instalment, Osar is a playable contestant within Termina, the sequel. Termina is an amazing game, so it's, it's really good. <laughs> it has a really unique aesthetic and vibe, probably more so than the title it's a sequel to, and if you've made it this far disregarding spoilers and haven't played the game, I massively recommend it. It's a contender for my favourite game ever, it might beat Silent Hill 2 out with a few more playthroughs. It's not quite as over the top edgy as the first game, it has a greater focus on narrative and a bit more character depth. If you played the first game and thought it was a bit too much, Termina might actually be okay for you. It's a wee bit easier and it's a bit more tasteful in how it uses over the top graphic content. I recommend you pick it up now and then come back and leave a comment about how good it is. That's very good for me, algorithmically speaking, but it's also good for the community. It's a parasitic relationship. Speaking of parasitic relationships, let's talk about the mastermind himself. Osar is a unique contestant in Termina, as he represents a lot of perspectives not often explored in the series. He's Abyssonian, a notable foreigner in Europa. His clothing and manner of speech all mark him as notably different from the other passengers aboard the train. He studies strange magic and forgotten occult secrets. He's learned in ancient knowledge, but utterly useless with the technology of the modern age. He's a student of Nasara, who he was called across the world by, and a survivor of the dungeons of fear and hunger. Unlike every other enlightened soul we see, Osar is not a new god candidate, but rather a uniquely modern thinker who, in a parallel to Kaiser, seeks to build on the knowledge of the old world to usher in the new. Osar is even shot by August who mistakes him for Kaiser, showcasing this parallel through visual shorthand. There are four ways Osar's story can go, but given that the Sulphur Cult story really has nothing to do with him, I'm going to ignore that and focus on the outcome of the other three options. The first thing that can happen to Osar is that he moonscorches. Moonscorching is where the Moon God Rare's influence causes someone to transform into a monstrous version of themselves that seems to reflect either their own insecurities or a twisted version of their deepest desires. When Osar moonscorches, he becomes the Mastermind, a creature that largely resembles himself but with a mushroom head. The Mastermind acts like a yellow mage from the first game. Many people have pointed out the similarities to the Cordyceps fungus, which you probably know about from Pokemon or The Last of Us, but this is only part of the visual symbolism here. There's actually an in-universe parallel, where the God of the Depths created the Mumblers that roam the thicket from the first game. The greater Mumblers are tragic figures who are said to achieve awareness but are unable to break free of the warped forms that have been forced upon them. We even find one in the Mahab library, perhaps a sad soul looking for answers as to why it's been cursed. So both out of game and in universe there's a precedent for fungi clouding the mind, but in the universe of fear and hunger it has a distinctly divine cause, be it the god of the depths or the moon god. Here we see Rare trap Osar in the trap of enlightenment that Sylvian and Grogoroth trapped his predecessors within, just in a much less subtle way. Whilst moonscorched, Osar adopts the lotus position, which is said to induce the state of Samadhi. Samadhi is the 8th and final step to enlightenment on the eightfold path of Buddhism. However, Osar's enlightenment here is a false enlightenment, just as Nasra and Vautil attained. In the eightfold path, the three main focuses across all steps are ethics, concentration, and wisdom, but Osar achieves none whilst in this state. He'll mindlessly attack anyone who comes close, which is a failure of ethics. His mind is clouded and he is unable to express any kind of thought, showing a lack of concentration, and he's fallen for the influence of the old gods, which we know to be a failure of wisdom. This false enlightenment is a visual metaphor for the ongoing struggle of humanity in this world and ties deeper into the lack of agency that marks the struggle of would-be enlightened souls. This has formitic links to the overall messages of the game, that humanity needs to find solace within itself, but it's also tying into the themes present in Osar's story. He's a character defined by freedom, but across the game he's pulled in the directions of guiding hands, be it travelling to find Nasra, or being moonscorched by Rare, or by being absorbed by logic. 
he has so little agency over himself. Logic is the machine god created by Kaiser, a calculating piece of technology that uses both the human soul and mechanical components to force humanity into the information age through brute force and godhood. In the game's ending A, logic activates and the world is brought into an information age where reason prevails and the afterlife of humanity is changed to be a strange green glow. This is basically the Lovecraftian internet turning on. And in a lot of people's interpretations of this ending, Osar is one of the four contestants consumed in the activation of logic. Both Mouth Doog and Worm Girl, popular fear and hunger content creators, put forward the following party as the group that activated logic. Abella, Karen, Olivia, and Osar. All of these characters make sense for story reasons, but there's also a lot of tragedy in them being subsumed into this machine. Each of these four is a character defined by a desire for freedom and a lifetime of limitations, so them being consumed to power Google Chrome, and the world entering a state of binary answers and cold logic, sees all of them ultimately failing to achieve the freedom they desire. On top of this, the only characters we know to be objectively correct about most of the stuff they discuss, Enki and Nosramus, speak extensively about how important the environment is, and logic is powered by an inversion of the rune of Vinushka showing logic will have disastrous impacts upon the natural world. Logic is, ultimately, a failed project, because Lagarde built it to answer a dilemma put forward by Nasra, an enlightened soul who fails to see the bigger picture. Nasra's cool, but he's wrong, he's one of the guys who failed enlightenment. Lagarde also venerates Battelle in the museum above the bunker, another person who was completely unable to walk the path of Nosramus. Lagarde has taken all the wrong lessons to heart. He venerates teachings of people we know to be wrong. So, in both of these outcomes, Osar's story is one of tragedy. A soul defined by a desire for truth and freedom being pulled into the machinations of greater beings that ultimately denies him the same awareness as Enki and Nosramus. Osar is just another Valtiel in these situations, doomed by limited knowledge. However, in his B ending, we see another outcome, and one I think would have really fun implications if it continued into any kind of sequel. The game's B endings are character specific, for the most part they just see the characters survive Termina and go on to live their life. Most bad, some good, but almost all inconsequential, the characters just go on and keep on living. Osar is an exception, he throws Nasra into a lake, returns to his homeland and seeks to topple the Church of all Mer, instilling himself at the top. Here Osar has toppled traditional theology and has utilised all he has learned from the collapse of the colonial states of Europa to introduce a new theocracy to war-torn Abyssonia, with himself an enlightened human with no divine purpose at the top. He's attained much of the wisdom of his forebears, but rather than existing in libraries and caves, he's gone out into the world to teach the people. I doubt this ending will happen, as for the most part Fear and Hunger follows real world history and something like this has never happened, but it would be cool to see the fallout of this in subsequent entries. The story implications for this ending are arguably bigger than either of the gods showing up in many ways. Sulfur largely recontextualizes older lore, and logic is the internet turning on, it's the birth of the information age. What occurs in Osar's B ending is a kind of esoteric Garveyism with no real world parallels to any real events or history. It's an alternate world where an enlightened wizard liberates Africa from the European powers only to ban Christianity and make himself the human messiah. It could see the Yellow Mages, or a new order started by Osar, becoming a force for change, and it could make Abyssonia an interesting setting to explore, as there are very few parallels in other fantasy properties. To see the followers of Enki and esoteric environmentalism collide and clash with the followers of Osar and eldritch post-colonialism set to the backdrop of a world defined by machines and systems of divinity created by fantasy Germans would be such a weird and cool setting. There's, there's nothing like that. Osar is a worthy entry in the canon of intellectualism within this world, but his story is often defined by the same failings as his forebears, his moon scorch and his absorption by logic seeing him fall unwittingly into the same mistakes as those who came before. Ironically, it's quite a lot like his master Nasra. 
This ending that actually sees him contribute to the canon of enlightenment is probably the least likely outcome for him. So for this reason I view him more as a commentary on how the soul is not a guarantee of greatness, how those with great potential can fall short and be crushed under the weight of the world. In the activation of logic, his fate could be seen as the death of traditional academia and knowledge as the information age changes the nature of knowledge itself. And that kind of brings me to my final point here. What does an enlightened soul look like in a post-logic fear and hunger? Because for all of this game's more crazy and out there themes, the enlightened souls being the true power behind the world is similar to our own history. These are the great thought leaders, the people who come up with the ideas and drive the world forward. And for the most part, they've been parallels to real historical figures. They've made sense. But there isn't really anything you can pull from to create a future genius or a future thought leader without making assertions about how the future is going to go. It's very unlikely in a potential fear and hunger free that there won't be an enlightened soul. The enlightened souls are the most prevalent soul archetype, as I've stated in this video. So what does an enlightened soul look like after logic? And I'll leave you with that question, so feel free to drop any answers below. Whilst you're there, also consider subscribing, liking, and if you really enjoy the content, you can become a channel member. That's a thing I'm doing now. Shout out to the one person who figured that out before I properly announced it. This video has been a nightmare to make. I lost all my footage and then had to go back and play these really difficult games a few more times, which I don't mind because I enjoy playing them. But my life for the last month has been fear and hunger runs in between shifts at work. <laughs> so yeah if the footage looks a bit spotty in places that's the reason why if you want to know what's coming next all of the information is on the community tab on this channel i do have a rough outline for videos i want to make across the remainder of this year the next one will be on house of ashes the supermassive game i have been condensing my thoughts on it into a script for a really long time now and I have a lot of thoughts on it. So that's going to be another big project. And I hope it goes smoother than this one. So that's everything from today. My channel updates, uh, this, that, or the other thing. I, I always do these really long rants at the end of the videos. I need to think of like a better, more concise way to end things really. But I don't know. I feel like this is the only time I really get to do a stream of consciousness thing that isn't heavily scripted. <laughs> so it's fun i guess all right um take care see you next time have a good day bye